Now we'll talk about some of the hormones that are involved in cardiovascular regulation. We have quite a few hormones that we'll talk about. We'll kind of cover these again um, when we do endocrine. So I'm just gonna do a really kind of surfacey talk about the hormones right now and their effects. We'll go into them in tons of detail throughout the endocrine system, which is coming up in like two chapters. So epinephrine and norepinephrine are normally neurotransmitters, right? It's kind of weird to talk about them when we're talking about hormones, but they can also act as hormones. Um, the difference between a neurotransmitter and a hormone, remember, is just that one is released from a neuron and goes directly across the synaptic cleft to the target cell. That's it. A really quick effect that's just at that one target cell. Um, when we release these epi and norepi into um, the bloodstream, they still work. They just travel through the blood and they can go to a big range of areas. It's not just one little target cell. They can go lots of places and have a really widespread effect. It takes longer because they're not just going straight across the cleft. They've got to enter the blood, travel around, leave the blood, and have an effect. So they take longer to work, um, and you have more of them being released and they have a longer effect, but you can use them as neurotransmitters or as hormones. So when we use um, epi and norepi, which we call catecholamines, um, we, they come from the adrenal medulla. We have two adrenal glands on the top of our kidneys. Okay, so one on top of each kidney, two total. So we've got these little like pyramids on top of our kidneys in the lumbar region. We call it like ad renal, right? The kidneys are renal, so ad renal. They're in addition to the, the kidneys, right on top of the kidneys. Well, when we look at the adrenal glands, they have um, a cortex all around the outside, and then this central area that we call the medulla. So when we're saying that these come from the adrenal medulla, we're saying it comes from the center of the adrenal glands, okay? Um, so when the epi and norepi come from the adrenal glands, they still have a very similar effect um, systemically. It's just that it's having a huge systemic effect, not as much of a targeted one. So they cause peripheral vasoconstriction. Um, and what does that do to pressure? <laughs> Increases pressure. Okay, so when we have a really big sympathetic response going on, we can release these from the adrenal glands and have a more sustained increase in blood pressure. They also have a very, very specific effect at the coronary blood vessels. Where do the coronary blood vessels give blood? The heart, right? Remember those are the little vessels that deliver blood to the heart muscle? <coughs> so it actually does the opposite there. It dilates the coronary blood vessels. And this is all based on receptors and receptor subtypes. Um, epi and norepi combined to multiple receptors and receptor subtypes. Depending on the receptor subtype, you have different responses. So peripheral vessels, it constricts them to increase pressure. But think about it, when you have a sympathetic response going on, you increase your pressure so you can push that blood forward to the capillaries and fuel your cells, but you don't want to constrict your vessels with your heart, right? Your heart's going to start pumping like crazy. So you actually dilate those vessels so that you can bring even more blood to your heart to fuel the muscle. Um, angiotensin II is produced when we have decreased blood pressure or blood volume. So angiotensin II, let's kind of write this out. It's, there's like a nice <coughs> progression here that's really important. Angiotensinogen. So angiotensinogen is inactive and it's always in your blood. Okay, it's just floating around, doesn't do anything on its own, but it's in your blood. So what happens is when we have decreased blood pressure or volume, your kidneys will release something, an enzyme called renin. Okay, so renin from the kidney comes and it acts on all of this angiotensinogen and it converts it to another molecule. It converts it to angiotensin 1. We're still not done though. This angiotensin 1 then gets converted to angiotensin 2 
and it does that via something called ACE. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to the active angiotensin 2. Has anybody heard of an ACE inhibitor? Yeah. If any of you work in a doctor's office, hospital, pharmacy, you've heard of ACE inhibitors. It's like the most common blood pressure medicine we use. Lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, all the prills are ACE inhibitors. They're blood pressure meds. How do they do that? They inhibit ACE. They stop that conversion. So angiotensin 1 does not get converted to angiotensin 2. So you prevent all these downstream effects that we're about to talk about by giving that ACE inhibitor. It's very, very effective. Um, so once we have this angiotensin 2 produced, it is a very potent vasoconstrictor. What happens when we cause systemic vasoconstriction? What do we do to blood pressure? We increase it, right? So it increases blood pressure that way but it also increases blood pressure by causing the release of other hormones that increase our blood volume. Okay, and when we have an increase in blood volume, that's gonna increase the pressure, right? If I have a vessel that's this big and now I'm gonna cram more fluid in it, there's gonna be more pressure in there, right? Anytime you cram more fluid in, you, you have more pressure. So um, it increases the pressure because of the vasoconstriction, but also because it releases ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. We'll talk about those on like the next slide, but both of those things promote fluid retention. Angiotensin II is really, really active. It has lots of effects everywhere, but the overall result is to increase blood pressure and increase blood volume. ADH, we said is antidiuretic hormone. Um, ADH comes from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Remember the pituitary gland hangs down um, below the hypothalamus and it has two lobes. It's got anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. They, all, they release very different hormones in different ways. Um, but ADH comes from the posterior lobe. It's released when we have decreased blood pressure or blood volume. Right, and angiotensin II is what stimulates that release when pressure or volume go down. So the overall point of antidiuretic hormone is then to correct that, right? Pressure and volume went down and it wants to increase pressure and it wants to increase volume to counteract that. So it elevates blood pressure and volume. Vasoconstriction elevates the blood pressure and then it promotes water retention at the kidneys. And look at the name, anti-diuretic. What's diuresis? Peeing, right? You like patients take diuretics. When you take a diuretic, you pee a lot, right? Diuresis is peeing, right? Eliminating a lot of urine. So anti-diuretic is anti-peeing. You don't pee as much. So you keep water in. Right, that's your water balance, is how much you pee. So if you pee less, more volume stays in. Okay, so it increases your blood volume by decreasing the amount of, or the, the amount of fluid that you urinate out. It also affects like thirst and some other minor things, but that's the big thing um, for increasing blood volume. Um, I, didn't, I don't have a slide for aldosterone, but bless you, the key thing with aldosterone is that it promotes sodium and water retention at the kidney. Um, and then also potassium excretion. So we get rid of, like we trade sodium for potassium. When we're making urine at the kidneys, we put potassium in the urine, we keep sodium back and water follows the sodium. So because we're pumping a bunch of sodium back into the body, out of the urine and into the body, the water just follows it. So we end up reabsorbing a bunch of water, right? That increases blood volume. The more blood we have, the more pressure there is in the vessels. Again, we'll talk about hormones in a lot more detail. 
when we do um, endocrine. This is just kind of summarizing all of that, you guys. This is a super, super busy slide. Um, so here we see normal blood pressure and volume. Blood pressure and volume fall. Right, so we don't have enough blood and we don't have enough pressure to keep the blood flowing to all of our vital organs. We have to fix that. So we do multiple different things to fix that. In the short term, we utilize um, the sympathetic nervous system, okay, and then we can utilize our epi and norepi as hormones. Right, so epi and norepi, and norepi come from the adrenal medulla. We said that they're gonna end up causing vasoconstriction that increases pressure, right? And because they're coming as hormones, it lasts longer than if it was just the pure neural response only. Um, and then we utilize other types of hormones to increase blood volume and blood pressure. We said that the kidneys release renin, and renin ends up leading to the activation of angiotensin two, right? Angiotensinogen went to angiotensin one, and then we use another enzyme, ACE, to convert angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Angiotensin II is what's active. It's a very potent vasoconstrictor that increases blood pressure. It also causes the release, here you see angiotensin II, causing the release of antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. Antidiuretic hormone pulls fluid back, so we have increased blood volume. Aldosterone holds fluid back, so we have increased blood volume. Um, this is just showing you the erythropoietin, which we talked about in the very, very first chapter when we did blood, right? That erythropoietin stimulates red blood cells, more red blood cells, more blood volume. Um, <clears throat> and we're not talking about like cardiac output because we talked about that when we did the heart. If the hormones set seem like a lot, just like stop looking at them as a whole and break it up. Just take one hormone a day. Make your little flashcards, take one hormone, where does it come from? What does it do? When is it released? Done. The next day, take the next hormones until you're just comfortable with all of them. Then you can look at the overall picture and stuff on what's happening, but try not to get confused with those big, huge pictures that are taking into effect the respiratory system, the cardiac, the blood, or um, the heart, the blood, like all this other stuff, and narrow it down to what we're actually focusing on, and then it won't get scary. So the last type of hormone that we have to talk about, um, hormones, are the natriuretic peptides. All of the other hormones that we've talked about so far work to increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. These are the opposite. Okay, these ones actually work to decrease blood volume and pressure. So the natriuretic peptides, um, ANP and BNP, so atrial natriuretic peptide is ANP and brain natriuretic peptide is BNP. They're released from the heart and they're released when the heart stretches too much. So think about the heart in diastole, right? So the heart's sitting there at rest and it's filling up with blood. If it stretches too much when it's at rest, that means too much blood has been crammed into it, right? Too much blood is coming back to the heart and being crammed into the heart. That stretches it so much that can damage the heart. So we wanna get rid of some of that blood somehow. So when the heart stretches too much, it can release ANP and BNP. And then these go and help us to try and get rid of some of that water and get rid of some of that pressure so that we decrease the amount of blood that's coming back and getting crammed into the heart. So they increase sodium excretion into the urine. What did I say it follows sodium? Water, right, water follows sodium. So if we're putting more sodium into the urine, what are we also putting into the urine? More water, so we're making more urine, right? We're promoting water loss okay, in urine. Decrease thirst, um, just so that you're not taking more fluids in, and then vasodilation, which would decrease blood pressure. Right? So the water loss is gonna decrease our blood volume. Um, that, in conjunction with the vasodilation, will decrease blood pressure. Now, all of a sudden, we're cramming less blood back into the heart. We're not overstretching it as much, we're not damaging it. And this is just showing us that. I'm not going to talk through it because we're really good. But. 
Um, and you guys, today, for like an hour before class, we were in the, the B2B room back there, and just some of your classmates was just kind of asking questions, and we, we drew out like have our exchange and just talk through whatever we need to talk through. So I don't want a huge group in there because then it'll be kind of, it won't be as productive. But if, you know, five or so of you guys want to go in there for an hour before class, I'm more than happy to just kind of do like an hour mini class with you guys and talk through things. I, my other job technically ends at 4.30, so I'm just sitting here for an hour anyways. Might as well put myself to use. 